count down to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, it is now time for more of the last comic shop! That is correct. We're opening the shop up to newbies to help them find their way underneath the big comic book tent. And we're keeping the lights on for those oldies that want to level up by knowing what's going on with comic books these days. Yeah, and we found out a lot of great stuff about comic books just this past weekend. Me, the host with the most, Andy Larson, as well as Chad Smith. uh, Additional host. Yes. (laughs) He and I were at the uh, Baltimore Comic Con. And thank you so much to the Baltimore Comic Con for letting us come. Being Clark Kent and Lois Lane to their uh, wonderful events and, and getting some great stuff and talking to a lot of great comic book creators. And uh, boy, they put on a great event. So if you ever have an opportunity to go to the Baltimore Comic Con next year, definitely do that thing because they were awesome. Also joining on today's program is our other co-host, J.A. Scott, who we wish had joined us at the Baltimore Comic Con because uh, I'm sure that he would have enjoyed it, too. I would have. But I didn't get to because I wasn't there because I'm over here. So I want to hear what these interviews sounded like. Oh, man. Well, I, we do have interviews for you. It's just that, boy, that there were so many good ones that I'll be very right. honest, still digging out a little bit. Yeah, the uh, interviews are neither here nor there. <laughs> yes, they're, they're nebulous right now. They're, they're still in the editing bay. And uh, we will promise that next week on The Last Comic Shop, you will get a bevy <laughs> of interviews with comic book creators uh so just stay tuned make sure that you're rate reviewing and subscribing to us so you don't miss out next week but for this week i thought because we don't have these interviews yet and the fact that we had to do black adam last week that we didn't actually really get to finish off our halloween spooky comic book month And so I thought that we would do another spooky comic book or spooky related comic book or just a comic book that was better than Black Adam. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that is right now the uh, the front runner for not the comic book we enjoyed the most this year when we get to our year end review. But I will say this. It was J.A.'s pick. And J.A., what did we decide to read uh, for your spooky Halloween choice? So we're going with The Labors of Magic, which was a four-issue miniseries, if you will, within the pages of New Mutants. New Mutants 25, 26, 27, and 28. Yes. And uh, gets all into some things she's going through in Limbo. So, you know, Limbo is one of Marvel's useful hell-type places. There'll be some demons. There'll be some horns. Right. Yeah. Maybe if we're lucky, Dark Child shows up. It's Magic's bogus journey. <laughs> it is. Which is, I, I thought, by far, the, the superior movie, by the way. Although, don't sleep on Bill and Ted 3. I swear, man, that movie came out, like, right as things were getting thick. And it was the movie I needed coming out of that pandemic. Bill and Ted, oh. Excellent Adventure 3, uh, where they face the music. Bill and Ted face the music. Uh, it's a great flick. You got it here. Our first recommendation of the show. And uh, again, I think J.A. picked this book because of his undying love for everything magic. Um, I don't know. Would you would you list her in your top three comic book characters of all time, J.A.? Ooh, that's, that's a hard question. I think, yeah, I think she's she's moving into the top three. Oh, look at you. Wow. Silver Surfer might have some uh, competition soon. She's got a lot more angst and, and, and things going on. The Silver Surfer can get a little bit tiring so sometimes because there's only so much space Jesus you can put up with. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure being played by Anya Taylor-Joy in the movie didn't hurt things either. No, Even no, not at all. Even though it was a made-for-TV movie. Which is, by the way, available out on uh, Disney Plus finally. So yeah, if you haven't checked out the New Mutants movie following today's you know show, go ahead and watch that. Then go back to the last Comic Shop archives and check out our review of the Demon Bear Saga. That's available, and that's kind of like kind of like a Halloween. That's it. Kind of- set the bar low. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. In any case, one thing that we don't set the bar low on every single week is our weekly polls. That's right. We set a high standard for J.A. to give us a great question every week that we pose to our last comic shop following out on Twitter at last comic shop. 
And uh, periodically on these uh, shows, we like to come back on and uh, recap the results for all of those listeners that were nice enough to uh, participate or those that did not, but we are encouraging to participate in future. So, J.A., we've got five polls, again, as we typically do on these recap shows, and I believe these are pretty much all of uh, from September uh, into early October, so we haven't really caught up yet. So what was the first poll that we'll be recapping today? All right, so the first poll was, what is the best Spidey suit? The the classic red and blue one, the black one, the iron Spider-Man suit, which makes an appearance in the comics and in the Avengers movie, or the 2099 suit with its spiky goodness. Hey, you forgot one huge one. I don't. I think some people commented on it. What about the Scarlet Spider? People love that, that hoodie look from Ben Riley's original appearance. At least I do. I love that. But, yeah, uh, less said about that one, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that is less said but better is what was the winner of this poll? Like, this was this was tight. Yes, it was. It was very tight down to the wire. Red and blue going up against black. They ended up tying. At 43%, 2099 came in a distant third at 11, and no one likes the Iron Spider-Man suit. They just think it's a gimmick. Well, I feel like we can have a little bit of a debate on this particular show about this, because I think we fall into two different camps. Maybe majority rules on this, but we'll see. Uh, I know I voted for Black Suit Spider-Man. That is my favorite look of all time, because that was the Spider-Man I grew up with. Honestly, you know, he was in the comic books way more than the blue and reds at the time. And I still remember uh, Secret Wars 6. And that just illustrates how little you know about what, what you're or about the things you're talking about. Because it was Secret Wars 8. <laughs> ah! And also the red and blue costume is timeless. Timeless, I say. And it has adapted and evolved and gone from the Ditkos to the Ramitas all the way to the McFarlanes and then back to the Ramitas. But that red and blue suit, uh, as long as they don't have the green glowing bugs in there, simply the best costume in all the comics. So I voted for the black costume as well, but mainly because I was hoping some sort of groundswell we can actually see it on the screen because I don't think... Spider-Man 3 is an accurate representation of the black costume. That costume that they put on the screen was horrible. It was just, they just took a regular costume and spray painted it. So, I mean, yeah, that is unfortunate. As much as I'm a fan of the red and blues, the black costume is that awesome look. And one of the things that makes it so awesome is how sleek it is. How it blends into the backgrounds and then you just have those white eyes and that white symbol. And that's you're not getting that in the movie. I, I, again, the, those are some of my favorite images of the black costume is him just peering out at the darkness at some sort of thug. And all you can see is the white eyes and the, and the white spider. Arguably one of the greatest covers uh, from that Craven's Last Hunt that we just reviewed a couple of weeks, months, some time ago. Is all black costume when he's coming out of the grave. So. Yeah. There are so many good ones, but there's so many good polls that we got to get to. So what's the next one, J.A.? Indie book that our fans want us to read next. So this was coming on the back of a a couple of indie books we had been reading. We tend to like to do, you know, not just Marvel and DC. Uh, We like to throw into indies. So we had four books up for vote. Fables, The Department of Truth, Chew, and Cerebus, the old classic. This was just a landslide for the department of truth 63 percent of votes went for the department of truth so it looks like we'll be reading that sometime in the future more james tinian the fourth we just covered something is killing the children on a previous show just a couple weeks ago so yeah that's still available if you haven't checked out a review for that and and we will get to it because if there's one thing that we do promise our fans is if you vote on a book for us to read we will read it we did that with mouse uh, and that won that poll that week and we ended up covering mouse so yeah in the next uh, coming months don't be surprised to find a department of truth book on uh, the last comic shop shelves people are trying to get me to board this tinian train not there yet let's see I'll give it another <laughs> shot well did you vote for that one chad or did you vote for something else no i didn't vote for that one uh, <laughs> probably chew i like chew and uh, we covered chew on an old show and it, it didn't go over as favorably but uh I think it's a really cool concept. One of those things that changes the way you look at the world for a little bit. Right. 
No, I enjoy Chew too. I, I but I didn't vote for that either. I think I did vote for Fables just simply because I feel like that has a lot of crossover appeal because people know about fairy tales. It's an easier in to the comic book market. The the neat thing about Fables is like it famously had a plan for the bad guy and then they changed because of rights issues where it was supposed to be Peter Pan all along. And then it turns out he wasn't into the public domain. And for whatever reason, they changed it to uh, Geppetto. But anyway, that's another book where I feel like it was supposed to end at a certain point, like issue 75. And then it just kept going for another 75 issues. And they recently brought it back, too. So I don't know if that's worth taking another look at or not. All right. Well, uh, what was our third poll, J.A.? So uh, while we're on the Department of Truth, I'm going to say that this next poll, while we tend to get about 50 to 100 respondents, sometimes a lot more, this got a whole whopping six. (laughs) So what was this dog of a poll? The Golden Age superhero comeback. Who do you want to see come back? Apparently, uh, I vastly overestimated either the interest in these superheroes or that anyone would know any of them. Uh, I think the winner was Phantom of the Fair. That's F-A-N-T-O-N of the Fair. He got the most votes simply because they like his name. The other ones were Super Rabbit, The Flame, or Moon Girl. I voted for Phantom of the Fair because I like that name. That's uh, Again, I'll use the word bevy. A bevy of superpowers for somebody that just evidently works uh, security at various carny shows. <laughs> I, I thought that was a lady, the Phantom of the Fair. It just sounded like a lady name. Well, the only other one that I knew out of this list was The Flame. I believe that's a character that uh, Will Eisner and um, Blue Fine. But, like, Super Rabbit, not sure who that is. Moon Girl I've heard of, too, because, again, I do these Cold Age covers. So I've seen moon girl but like a lot of other people i did not have a dog in this fight (laughs) super rabbit is essentially the mighty mouse of the rabbit why he didn't win i I know mysteries of the universe (laughs) because you you sold me on he was the mighty mouse of something else (laughs) let's move on to our next poll we had a better turnout for this one yes the next one got a lot more votes uh we returned to uh solid ground on who's your favorite daredevil villain bullseye kingpin the hand or the purple man i will say that no one voted for the purple man so i guess they were thinking that that's more jessica jones or i mean that's hard not to think of purple man and jessica jones now this is the netflix mcu having its uh influence on our voting all right well our daredevil aficionado chad who did you vote for sir for me this is the two horse race you've got uh Bullseye, who's more of the crazy pants, boots on the ground, or the kingpin, which is like the big boss. And so which would you rather go with? Which do you think has caused more chaos? Or And so ultimately, at the end of the day, because kingpin's the guy pulling the strings, I'm going kingpin. I went with the opposite. I went with Bullseye, just simply because, again, I feel like in some ways, Bullseye is now like Daredevil's equivalent of Venom. Like he's the equal but opposite character, which is always a great trope in comic books. You know, he he represents chaos, whereas Daredevil represents order. But uh, J.A., who ultimately won between the two wars? So uh, Kingpin took it with 50% of the vote. I voted for the hand because I say that they are the ones ruling everything in the background, in the shadows. Even the Kingpin is part of the hand. He just doesn't know it. (laughs) Ha ha! Could have put Electra. Would you consider Electra a villain? I was I was thinking about it. I was going to put her, then I wasn't. Then I was going to put her, then I wasn't. Then I was like, oh, I'll have to save her for another poll. Would you consider your wife or girlfriend a villain? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, what was our last poll, J.A.? Uh, this one is perfect for the uh, Halloween season. Best Marvel Monster. Ah, yes. Uh, this is about the time that uh, Werewolf by Night was gracing all of our tv screens that wonderful wonderful special which i hope that they do so many more every single halloween season but what were the choices ja they had werewolf by night morbius fin fang foom very fun to say and man thing i know who i voted for which i think he was the eventual winner everybody was burning for a little man thing right 
Uh, oh, yeah. I, even before the Werewolf by Night show came out, I was burning for some man thing. And that sounds weird to say. I should mute myself again. All right. See you. <laughs> but how much did he win by? Like, it, it was close. It wasn't, it wasn't like a runaway. Well, the other three sort of split votes up a bit, and he got 43%. It was almost a tie between Werewolf by Night, uh, even with the show, and Fin Fang Foom. Yes. Come on. He wears purple underpants now. Like that's Everywhere. I think we're all just hoping we see Fin Fang Foom in the next uh, Shang-Chi movie. Well, I had commented on our site that I, I thought the It's Morbin time folks were going to show up and just wreck this pole. Just come in <laughs> with their Morbius sweep and make this a ridiculous win for Morbius. Th- those are some of the best memes, though. Every single time I uh, I see a Morbius sweep meme, I always laugh. I saw one where it was basically folks that have seen Morbius, folks that have not seen Morbius, and they're shaking hands, and in the middle it's the Morbius sweep. <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't come in and, and wreck shop on this poll, and, and Man-Thing ultimately was the winner, which is true if you like werewolf by night make sure that you're checking out our twitter page because i'm always posting check out man thing if you've never checked out any man thing books in the past steve gerber's run awesome can't recommend that enough but yeah those were our weekly polls and uh, make sure that you're tuning in every single thursday uh to the last comic shop uh for our weekly polls out at last comic shop on twitter Right after these commercial breaks, we're going to be back with New Mutants and some magic. Hello, friends. Do you like the 80s and Transformers? We are the Autopod Decepticast, and we started our podcast doing a minute-by-minute breakdown of the 1986 classic animated feature, Transformers the Movie. We've since moved on to an episode-by-episode review of the G1 series and just started Season 3. We have over 180 episodes, so if you're just discovering our show, there's plenty of gold to stuff into your ears. And it is very funny and fantastic. I'm not biased... We are on every podcast aggregator you could possibly stomach. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and our web presence is autopoddecepticast.com. We are at apoddecast on Twitter and all of the things. Autopod Decepticast, friends, for all your animated Transformer needs. Bye, bye, bye. And we're back with this week's Read Pile Review. It is my pick. The Labors of Magic, this was a New Mutants run in their normal monthly issues, 25 through 28, right? 25, 26, 27, 28. That's yes. how math works, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Chad, give us the who what's it? who wrote the story, did the art. Okay, yeah, I'll give you the who's it, and then we'll save the what's it's that happened for Andy. But we've got Vita Ayala as writer. You have Rod Reese, who was the artist on the the main story, although we did have some flashbacks by Jan uh, Dersima and Ruth Redman with colors on that one. We had BC's Travis Landham on letters and production, and Tom Muller and Jay Bowen get design credit for uh, the after effects of the Hickman X universe, where everything has that design flowing through it. Which, by the way, I'm going to comment. The worst thing about this whole post-Hickman universe is the fact that, like, now in a comic book, you just get a one page of text. Here's part of the script. You can just read the script if you want to. We're not going to bother to draw this. What you're supposed to do is copy them and then put them in a file folder. They're kind of like the comic book equivalent of the G.I. Joe file cards. (laughs) Are you saving all the reports, J.A.? Yes, I am. It's lazy. I don't like it. I didn't like it here, and I don't like it in other X-Books. That's what I'm saying. Just wait. They're going to put out an omnibus of just the reports pages. (laughs) Oh, man. Like the Marvel handbook. It'll be the lowest selling omnibus in history. You know I'm going to buy it. You know it. (laughs) This is the equivalent of a comic book dictionary. I have it on my shelf. And I really just used it as a doorstop. One thing you don't use as a doorstop, though, is the 10 cent synopsis for this week's, again, collection of four issues from New Mutants, this labors of magic. And it basically revolves around the fact that, like, boy, magic is really sick of commuting back and forth to Linda. Like, she's like, look, I need a better commute route. Like, I'm working as, like, one of these war generals in Krakoa, doing these other things. I don't need to be spending time overseeing all these demons in limbo like that's 
I don't know. There's there, there's somebody else that can use that job more than me. And so she finds somebody with the recently resurrected Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, who you might know was uh, a clone of Jean Grey created by Mr. Sinister. And uh, then Scott Summers treated her like crap because Jean Grey came back. And so she went crazy and started the whole Inferno crossover in the late 80s. I think she died at the end of that. I don't know because I, I was only reading the Spider-Man issues of Inferno anyways. She's Cable's bum and she's got it going on. Yeah. Carry on. Oh, but she's been recently resurrected by the uh, Grand Council or whatever they call it, the inner circle uh, there on Krakoa. And she doesn't have anything to do now. So uh, Magic was like, hey, you'd be good to run Limbo. Here, here's the keys to the kingdom. Yeah, I know that last time you were running Limbo, you tried to bring it to Earth. But <laughs> you, you learned your lesson. Exactly. It's all about second chances. Even though, again, uh, Danny Moonstar and, and Wolfsbane, her, her longtime friends have been like, no, this is a bad idea. No, she's still like, oh, you need to be broken in order to run hell, and, I mean, hell, you're broken. After that, Sin shows up, which is this big demon dude, and breaks a soul sword, and then it turns into kind of three issues, the magic equivalent of the Christmas Carol, where she goes and sees the magic of the future, and the magic of the past, and the magic of the present, even though it's out of order. And eventually she gets her groove back and, I don't know, turns things over to Madeline Pryor. But that's pretty much it. The labors of magic. Not 10 cents, probably more like 25, but I think everybody can agree that this was something of a story. And so I think you deserve that whole quarter of synopsis. Thank you for that. I think you missed basically some massive plot elements, but we'll get into them in our review. Uh, First, I want to turn it over to Chad. All the Goblin Queen stuff. That is, again. No, the the whole, like, that her soul sword got broken and then she had to figure out how to. I came for Madeline Pryor. She's my babe. I'm I'm showing up for my my woman. I'm just going to point out that that Madeline Pryor is, is the Madeline Pryor that you all remember in that very 80s costume. So, that being said, Chad, there were two kind of stories. You had a flashback story and you had the concurrent story, and I know that you're not a big fan of artist switches. How did you handle this one? I feel like there's a way to handle artist swaps mid-story, uh, and this is the way I would usually prefer, where they had the, the Jan Dershima handling the flashback sequences of the, you know, little Alanya uh, stuck in Belasco's prison reading the, the tales and so I, I don't mind this as, you know, as far as artist changes are going to go. Like if you, if you're going to have multiple artists, that's fine. And I felt like Jan Dersima's art, it even fit the story. And I, I'll be honest, I I've known her work from way back in the day on X factor when she took over, like post the Joe Quesada era. And I, I wasn't the biggest fan. I know she's done a lot of star Wars work and it's never really connected with me, but here I thought it was fine. And then the Rod Reese, his art, I always look at Rod Reese as like a slightly more fun Phil Noto where it's, you know, pretty realistic, but also he can go a little bit silly sometimes. And so as far as the overall art's concerned, I thought the art was, you know, it was quality stuff throughout the course of the book. Yeah. One thing I really loved, and I was even talking to Andrew before the show about it, was those single page panels that were meant to be like the storybook that was being told throughout the story i thought that was just incredible those very painterly they almost look sort of bill sinkevich like oh yeah with the teeth and the big black shadowy yeah. background characters yeah but i know andrew that you mentioned before the show that uh one of these issues you really loved and the rest were just kind of meh so yeah. let's start on the high and then i can tell you why you're wrong with the meh <laughs> Well, I I will say this, that again, it reinforces a a major reason why I don't read X books. You know, I did read, uh, what, House of X, Powers of Ten. I did read, is it X of Swords or is it Ten of Swords? Ten of Swords, whatever. We read both of those on on shows in the past. So I kind of sort of know what's going on with Krakoa, but I really don't. Like, this is something that's happening. And again, it's a reason why I'm getting comic books with one pages of text. There's all these, like, soap opera elements of the X-Men, and unless you're really paying attention, you can kind of get a little bit lost. This is a little bit better because, again, I have read some New Mutants. And so they give you a core member of the New Mutants that I, I actually really like. Uh, whether you've read 
the old stuff, the period when Chris Claremont and um, Bob McLeod were doing it, or into the Sienkiewicz period. They give you three classic members of that New Mutants team. They give you Magic, they give you Wolfsbane, they give you Danny Moonstar. And again, some of my favorites. You just throw Cannonball into the bunch, and you've got yourself a, a New Mutants team that I can get behind. They're your main three characters, and they're going on this mission that, again, it's four issues about the transfer of power from one queen to another. That's pretty much what it is. I'm not going to hear any ifs, ands, or buts about that. That's what the story starts out as, and that's what the story finishes with. So that's the story. Like all the rest of it is just like un- underneath the surface stuff. But the one issue that I really, really loved was the second one, where you go into the future, and you see this uh, magic who's like Cable-esque and, and has an awesome arm that's made out of another new mutant warlock, who is, again, one of my favorite new mutants fighting against demons that have been infected with the techno virus, which harkens back to all that uh, Bilk Sienkiewicz art. And I always like the look of the techno virus. I think it looks super cool when you're actually infected with it fully because you're like that black, yellow kind of circuitry looking stuff. And that's great. And so it's like a whole issue about everybody's died and she's like last person. And so it's all post-apocalyptic. And and if I just read that issue and nothing else, I, I would have been happy with this but then there was those other things which are just like all right well whatever colossus shows up okay him and magic are are back together and being family members again i i I just didn't care you can say i'm wrong ja i i I can see where you're going with that i i will say that your favorite issue was also my favorite issue for similar reasons but also i thought you you got sort of this is what magic would be when she's old she's like Every time they the hordes attack, she does something that kills a little bit of her and kills a little bit of Warlock, but it kills a lot of demons as well. And so the younger Magic says, so why do you do it? She's like, because at least if I'm going to die, I'm going to take as many of them with me as I can. <laughs> uh, yes. What I like about it, and it actually melds well with what I'm going to recommend in our next segment, is it's Magic going through still sort of PTSD from when she was taken by Belasco and still trying to come to terms with that and come to terms with being, you know, the the queen of limbo and, and everything that comes with that. And if I could say anything, you know, that goes against that is sort of, I didn't think they went in depth enough with that. And I felt that it, it wrapped up very quickly. <laughs> it's called the labors of magic and she's supposed to be sort of dealing with the fact that in the first issue her soul sword which is a part of her being her essence essentially gets destroyed and it's supposed to be unbreakable which means her soul's in jeopardy and she's lost the ability to form it which not isn't just that means that she's lost her power set but it means that she's struggling with her identity and struggling with what it means to be queen of limbo, what it means to be magic, is dark child coming out at some point. I thought they could have dealt a lot more with that, dealt a lot more with the trauma. I like the flashback scenes because I thought the flashback scenes were much better at doing that than the actual story, which got a bit sort of standard comic-y at times, maybe too easy. I don't know. Chad, what do you think? to piggyback off of that i feel like you you never really felt anything in this story like the biggest conflict was oh we're gonna sign limbo over to madeline Pryor, and danny moonstar and wolfsbane are like i don't think you should do that and magic's like yeah because she's a little messed up but that's why i should but like that was the main crux of the story and everything else just seemed like oh let's have some action sequences oh let's bring in you know different magics from other places and it was neat and if I were reading uh, New Mutants and Issues, which I, I'm not, I uh, you know I jumped off after House of X and Powers of Ten and all that stuff. Like to dive back in and read this, like it, it seems like fine monthly comic booking, but this isn't a story that really stands out or like I'll remember next week. You know, there were no stakes there. Even the the Colossus Alanya relationship, uh, there wasn't anything there really. You know, the, those emotional beats. You know, the, whatever the, that music is, I don't think it was played nearly enough to be effective. So, like, I was entertained throughout the course of these issues. Uh, and if this were a book that I was buying on the monthly, I certainly wouldn't drop it because of the story. But I also don't think this is one that's going to inspire me 
you know, none of the other new mutants really got a, a play, even Warlock, who plays in prominently. You don't really understand what Warlock's going through. Like, I just feel like a lot of the emotional beats are lost here for uh, office politics. Well, I, I want to just say, look, I understand why I feel J.A. liked this book. Because I, I feel like if you're a, a fan of magic, if magic is one of your favorite characters, then this is a very satisfying chapter in the overall story arc of this particular character, right? This is actually a very important... I was going to say, was it, though? Like, I, did sto- did you feel the story? I, I didn't feel the story. I, I think, to Ch- Jay's point, it told some good stuff about Magic's future. It, it got to the heart of who Magic is. She was trying to work for her soul. I think that genuinely, if you like Magic, then you're going to like this story. I, I just think, if you don't have a, a dog in that race... You know, if you're not like magic's one of my favorites, then again, it's just a, a traditional story. And I, I don't know if the stakes are strong enough or made strong enough for you to be like, yes, this puts me over the top in being now a huge magic fan. I, unless that one issue, it was awesome. Like, I won't lie. Yeah. And I was a big fan of seeing the Goblin Queen reclaimed as the Goblin Queen, and and she goes in, and there are a bunch of demons saying, oh, this is horrible, we just gave up one queen, now we've got another queen, she's bad, we should rise up against her, and she shows up and cuts the guy's head off and basically says, uh, I heard you guys crave strong leadership, so if there are anyone else who would like to air grievances, as she holds up the guy's head. That's my, my one other question I have, is like, is this ultimately going to be bad news? Did Magic make the bad choice here? I, I think that Madeline Pryor is going to come back and create another uh, Inferno. And that's where, if this was a Claremont penned book, besides getting more into sort of the catharsis and what Magic is going through and, and stuff, I think we would have been left with a much more questionable cliffhanger like we don't know what's going on but something is this one just felt a bit too neat and tidy and And plus the solicits have been telling me about how magic's gonna team up and fight spider-man you know it's gonna be magic and venom and whatever else in the dark web crossover coming soon to comic books near you that that is interconnected web of marvel comics nowadays it gets very confusing i I, I think that's the biggest question mark for me and honestly if if they don't make (laughs) <laughs> Madeline Pryor a bad guy again and have her run rampant or, or or at least have conflicting goals to the mutants in Krakoa, then I think they're missing out on a, on, a, on a big opportunity there. It's not just Madeline Pryor, it's Madeline Pryor and Ben Riley who they've decided to make a bad guy for reasons that don't always make sense in my head. They're teaming up to make the dark web. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, look at it. That's because both of them are clones that got shit on. Let's just be honest. That's why they're teaming up. They're both clones, and nobody gave them any respect. They're the Rodney Dangerfield uh, club of the Marvel Universe. (laughs) Well, I mean, they have to do something because Limbo, kind of like Otherworld, is one of those areas where they can say that that whole you-can-come-back-if-you-die mutant thing doesn't exist, which is giant effing problem with Krakoa on Earth is that there's no consequences to anything because mutants just can come back with their golden balls and their pods and everything. They're all pod people now. You know, they're, they've got to build these places up and if Limbo's controlled by magic, that's not going to happen. So, And plus, I don't know how this is all interconnecting with this huge, massive uh, storyline that's going on with the Axe crossover, the Avengers, X-Men, Eternals thing that I've been reading up on, and we'll see how that all plays out. But in any case, uh, one thing that's going to play out is our ratings, and that's right after these commercial breaks. So stay tuned for more of The Last Comic Shop and that. Hi, and welcome to The Capsule Life, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. You can also check out our website, www.thecaptionlife.com, to find out where you can listen to us, a list of all of our episodes, and where you can find us on social media under the user name at Caption Life. You'll get a new episode from us every week, so hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. 
you ever wondered what comics Mark from Vale of is into? What Zach from Left Behind's favorite MCU movies are? Well, Metalcore Nerds is the show for you. My name is Sean Mott, and here at Metalcore Nerds, we cover the latest things in pop culture, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, DC, AEW, and everything else in between. You can listen to the show every Monday on Adobe Howl at 7 p.m. Eastern, or find it anywhere you find podcasts after it debuts on the radio station. All right, back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our rating, where we hope that we don't leave our fans in limbo wondering about what we're going to rate this week's book. Trust me, we won't, because it's coming right now. Jay Scott's going to give us that one out of four scale, as we often do for every single show. So what is the one out of four scale this week? Oh, this one pretty much presented itself. We read a book called The Labors of Magic that was four issues, so this is one out of four labors of magic. (laughs) like the little baby sound effect i just put that's that's the best <laughs> it's it's not that kind of labor it's more like labors of hercules like she's going through a quest i, I thought the baby sound effect was cute any case so uh we're gonna start off with uh, chad and and chad what how many labors are you giving this book so at the end of the day like i said earlier this was a fine comic book i i it didn't leave a huge lasting impression on me but i worry that i'm, I'm sounding harsher than i intend to like it was fun it had moments of cleverness it had moments of joy it had moments of magic being badass which when you're reading a magic story that's what you want would i have liked a little bit more pathos a little bit more depth to it uh sure but this was lots of fun i'll give it a solid three i'll go next and i think i'm going to give it a little bit lower than a three i think i'm going to go about 2.75 on this one it is above average I'm not a huge fan of X-Men books traditionally, but this was a a group of X-Men that I I do know. I I do like the New Mutants. I do like Wolfsbane. I I do like Danny Moonstar. I do like Magic. I do love Madeline Pryor. So that was like a good team for me. And I I will say that that one issue uh, where they go into the future and the awesome badass uh, magic of the future with her uh, warlock arm is awesome and i think i would have given that like a 3.5 just for that issue alone i really love that issue but the rest of the series kind of brings it down because i was just like "Eh, i don't really care about this soul sword quest thing just a transfer of power in the end and that's great maybe it's setting up other things but it was average and if you have an opportunity and you're an x-men fan again they're going to be releasing this in trade next week at your local comic book shop so if you like the x-men and you like the new mutants and even if you've seen the New Mutants movie, and that's all you know, I think you should pick this up because it gives you characters that are in the movie. And I think it's a good jumping on point if you want to read New Mutants after that because they give you those three characters that are in the movie. So you can just jump into this and, and figure it out from there. So yeah, for new fans, this might be a, a good entry point. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think it is a really good entry point for New Mutants and for Magic fans uh, because it ties back to a lot of earlier stories of her. And after you read this, then you can go back and read the original Magic miniseries, Storm and Ilyana, I believe it is, or Magic. You can just get it as a Magic trade paperback, which tells the story of her in limbo being trained by Velasco and ultimately going there when she's seven and coming back when she's what 13 or whatever 14 in between two issues of the new mutants so great and also once you read that then you'd have to go into inferno so you understand the whole madeline prior saga and then and then you're sucked in then you're in the x-men world and, and you're you know you get your head above water and you've read 300 issues of claremont what i loved about this book was the flashback the main story and then you had this storybook which tied to the main story but was actually from the flashback because it's the flashback where she's reading this storybook giving her power to overcome Belasco. i thought it tied together really well it needed to go a little deeper for me as i said it didn't feel like she had a lot on the line unlike the book that i'm going to recommend and in, in our recommendations so that being said i would say that it's about a three but it's a magic book so it's a three and a half well 
Let's get to those recommendations. Uh, since Jay Hay has been talking about this book that he's going to be recommending for all our fans uh, quite heavily. So again, pick up these other comic books at your local comic book shop. In addition to The Labors of Magic, which I mentioned will be out in a trade starting next week at your local comic book shop. So make sure that you pick up. We'll go ahead and start off with J.A. because, again, he's been teasing this all of our fans for like two segments. So what is this recommendation you keep talking about, J.A.? So I am going to recommend X in Furnace. It was a limited series, one through four, also now collected in a trade by C.B. Sibolsky and Giuseppe Camicoli. And it is essentially... The reintroduction to the Marvel Universe of Magic. It's the sequel to Inferno. Magic has been stuck in limbo. She's lost her soul. She's lost her soul sword. She's lost the Bloodstone, which has also a bit of her soul. And she's in limbo, fighting, just going on a war rampage as her dark child self. So she's got horns. She's got a tail. She's got cloven hooves. And she's... Going all out, and Colossus on Earth is trying to get the X-Men to come and save her. And it I knew I loved it from page one, where Colossus is saying, Scott, we've got to go save her, and we can't go in, Limbo's closed, you know this. You know if it was Gene, you'd do anything. I should have expected as much from a man who left his brother for dead in space. Oh, wow. My goodness. Great shade. And then he turns around and goes, Can't not stop thinking about the suffering my poor little snowflake must be enduring. And he he turned the page and it's a full page of her, like, surrounded by dead goblins and in fire, just killing people. Cut off their hearts and bring me their heads! Well, I thought you were going to say that it it caught you from that one cover. Oh, the covers are great, too. Yes. It doesn't look like any snowflake on that cover. So, uh, long story short, she is fighting to reclaim her soul sword and her soul and the bloodstone. And Belasco's daughter has gone in to try to reclaim Limbo. And there's this neat little scene at the beginning where Belasco's daughter goes to this round table made up of Mephisto and Dormammu and a couple of her like big demons. And apparently there's demon Algonquin round table. Where all these demons go and they talk about, I don't know, demonic things. Hell is there. Is that what the X-Men are now, though? Just a bunch of meetings? Apparently. It's it's a nice four-issue run. There's a lot of, unlike what we just read, I think there's more at stake for magic. Because she starts out as a demon. And at, by the end, she's come back to the X-Men. But she still has the horn. She still has a lot of work to do. So if you're reading the new New Mutants run and you just read The Labors of Magic and you want to know a little bit more backstory on magic, this would be one to recommend. Heck yeah. So uh, when I think of the New Mutants and I think X-Men, I go back to one of my favorite periods of that time, the the early 90s. And who emerged from there but uh, Rob Liefeld. And uh, when I was coming up for a recommendation this weekend, he's like, have you been reading any uh, X-Men stuff? Well, not really. Like... I, I said when we reviewed uh, Hawks and Pox that I was just going to wait and let this John Hickman stuff work itself out and see if it was good or not and then go back. But uh, I have been reading an X-Book, book, lo and behold. It was Deadpool Bad Blood, which is originally uh, an OGN, original graphic novel, but Marvel decided to take it back, chop it up into issues, and re-release it again. But it is written by Rob Liefeld. It is drawn by Rob Liefeld. A number of different inkers there. And it is something that I don't know if it's in continuity or not, but it harkens back to the old school Deadpool from the earlier 90s, I should say. There is a big bad named Thumper who has a connection to Deadpool. And then other characters from the old X-Force days, including Cable, including Domino, including Shatterstar. There's even some cannonball in this book. Yeah, there's even a moment in the first issue where the old school X-Force is going up against the MLF and Shatterstar goes up against the Reaper and cuts his hand off again, just like he did way back in those little X-Force issues. But uh, if you enjoyed that stuff, this series harkens back to the the joy and the excitement of that time. You get a Garrison Kane appearance from Weapon H. Oh, Uh, jeez. 
I know. It's tons of fun. It was a four-issue series. It's already been collected originally as that uh, graphic novel. There's going to be a sequel coming sooner or later called Deadpool Batter Blood. So uh, get on board now. Check out Bad Blood. See what you're missing. This great, wonderful Rob Liefeld, Deadpool, X-Force characters from the early 90s. Is well, the uh, is the Wolf Spain equivalent? I forget her name. Feral. Feral is Feral. not in here. No, we've jettisoned Feral. She was like Wolf Spain with a purple leotard. Come on, tell right. me Boom Boom's there. Uh, now I'm going to go back in the first issue and see if Boom Boom makes an appearance. Proud Star Warpath is in here. And Cannonball and Domino. Domino, you get a couple of different haircuts for Domino. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want Boom Boom chewing bubble gum before she's about to kick ass. <laughs> my favorite one where she had the big bubble it was like how big's uh, rob liefeld gonna make that bubble <laughs> big enough to boom, obscure boom, some feet <laughs> oh, wow. wow low blow literally at, at foot level <laughs> but no there's great rob liefeld art in here and he has feet the characters have feet they have legs to stand on come on man come all on. right yeah uh, and and, and- to be fair, I've been reading the epic collection of Bishop, the Bishop introduction to the Marvel Universe, and there's uh, there's some Rob Liefeld from that. And I forgot that, you know, it's some of it's really good. Oh, yeah. It's, it's great. I'm so, I forget that Rob Liefeld's good. <laughs> but yeah, I think I, to remind us. <laughs> I think sometimes he it's easy to, to pick on him because everyone does unfairly so. Now that I'm older... I prefer his art because it at least it has a bit more style to Jim Lee. I used to love Jim Lee, and now I look at Jim Lee stuff and I'm like, ugh, it's just sort of like paint by numbers. Right? No, that's that. That was shocking to me when I realized that like Jim Lee art, like it's just okay. It's, it's missing something. Like it has no heart. The Jim Lee art, but Rob Liefeld, it's got heart in spades and blood spurts from that heart. <laughs> And all sorts of chaos. Well, my recommendation this week is for those folks that aren't sticking around for X-Books. Like, if you're not a fan of X-Books, but you just want another comic book to read, I've got a great one for you that I read every single time this part of the year rolls around. And this part of the year being the fall. It is a book called Mouse Guard, Fall 1152. It's by a wonderful artist and writer named David Peterson, who I had an opportunity to meet at New York Comic Con a couple years ago, he actually made me some awesome book plates for uh, my, my kids' books, which are awesome. So kudos to David Pearson for those. But yeah, Mouse Guard uh, Fall 1152 is uh, this actually the second part of a little bit of a trilogy of Mouse Guard books. And for those folks that don't know what the Mouse Guard is, it's not so much anthropomorphic mice. It's like, what if mice had just human intelligence? But they're still mice, and they still act like mice, they still look like mice, they just have the ability to talk and develop societies and fight with swords, be able to harness basic tools. And so it's a, it's a wonderful story about what would happen if you took a mouse society like that and it pretty much mirrored the same developments that we had in human society, especially in the Middle Ages, folks that were protecting merchants as they traveled from one city to another against quote-unquote bandits, but in this case, it's the traditional enemies of mice, snakes, weasels, giant crabs, which aren't exactly giant crabs, they're just normal-sized crabs, but like, you know, they could kill a mouse. And this particular story is all about uh, a secret rebellion among a super a certain group of the mice uh, that are trying to take over the mouse guard, which are the protectors of this realm, kind of like the Knights of the Round Table, and, and plans being leaked to these underground folks so that they can take over the mouse citadel. And it's just uh, interesting stuff with beautiful, beautiful art. This is an all-ages book, honestly. Uh, whether you're 6 or 60, uh, you're going to enjoy Mouse Guard. And it introduces one of the major components of the Mouse Guard universe, which is a character called the Black Axe. Kind of like the most badass mouse warrior ever. And everybody thought he was dead, but he's not. He comes back with his Black Axe. Makes for an interesting read. So yeah, if you've never checked out David, David Peterson's Mouse Guard universe, I would highly recommend it. Again, it's great for everybody.
And one other thing that's great for everybody is The Last Comic Shop. And we the hope that it's great for you in future by encouraging you to rate, review, and subscribe to our terrific podcast so you come back next week. As I promised, next week we're going to have some of those interviews with comic book creators from Baltimore Comic Con that Chad and I got. So uh, make sure that you're tuning in and you can do that by going out to our website, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. And you can always check things out on the socials on Twitter and Instagram at Last Comic Shop, where you can find things like our weekly polls that Jay puts up. You could find the Golden Age covers to put you to bed at night. You could find just general comic talk. What are we picking up at the shops that week? Uh, what sort of comic book series are uh, lighting our fires? And what are some things that we just think are fun to talk about? So find all that on social media if you don't know where to find us you can always go back to home base www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com where you can find what else ja that's right you can find links to our merch store we've got glass comic shop t-shirts tote bags mugs this week soul swords and just to clarify that's not soul swords not sell swords we're, we're not selling mercenaries and if it's like magic you might get that extra golden armor but you're gonna have to pay extra for that Oh, yeah. Soul Swords only. Yeah, there's upgrades for that. Anyways, that's all available there. Grab yourself a t-shirt. Buy one for your friend, too. There you go. And while we might be the last comic shop podcast and hope to be the last comic podcast you need, we don't want to actually be the last comic shop. So we encourage everybody to go out there to a shop near you. Uh, you can use the comic shop locator, www.comicshoplocator.com, to find one if necessary. But you might uh, be interested in picking up the labors of magic. <laughs> which has been running in that new mutant series that is still ongoing, or you could pick up X in furnace by CB Sabolsky and Giuseppe Kamen Cooley or some Deadpool bad blood in either single issue form or graphic novel form. Uh, or maybe you want to go with the mouse guard, the fall 1152 or any of the other cool mouse guard books that are out there. All that and more waits for you at your local comic shop. So check it out. We hope that you check out The Last Comic Shop again next week. I was the host with the most, Andy Larson, joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott. And as always, stay safe, stay warm, because it's getting chilly. You know, it's getting close to that. And remember, oh, oh it's magic, you know. Something and something and something. Oh, whoever knows those lyrics. The last comic shop was a 2022 Black Angus production.